Awesome. <clears throat> All right. So today, you read um, through this types of arguments reading that I put together from arguments and arguing. And here, what you got through was uh, warrants and the Toolman model for the most part. We're going to be talking about a bit more than that. Uh, instead of that, we're going to be addressing uh, not only three, but six argument structures. The first three are just introductory argument structures to get you into the idea of arrangement to illustrate the first big point that I have about the structure of the speech. And the second is more in line with the templates that you're going to be using throughout the rest of this class. So what that means is that at the very beginning of this lecture, or the beginning of the class, I'm going to talk about three structures. One of them is the standard issue persuasive speech in most college classrooms. The second one is going to be Monroe's motivated sequence. And then the last one is going to be Cicero's uh, method of proof. Those three structures are there just to illustrate the principle of, uh, principle of structure, which is that some things need to be in certain order when they are delivered in a speech format. The other three speech templates that we're going to be looking at, the ones that are much more important, and the ones that you're going to have uh, on your plate for the rest of the semester, are the last three. And those are the Toolman model, the structure of logical dependency, and then the stock issues. Those are the ones that I want you to focus your attention on. Those are the ones that you should be using in order to think through the debates that you're actually going to deliver in class. Okay. So um, just starting with what's uh, on the handout here, I'm going to read to the first sentence. And then, if possible, I'd like to do what we did last time and just have other people from the class read through the handout as well. Okay. So in Cicero's canon of rhetoric, arrangement is particularly important. Arrangement describes how ideas and emotions are laid out for an audience to receive. Arrangement is important for us for at least two reasons. First, because the audience has to understand the message. Can I get a volunteer speaker? Um, unlike the readers in written texts, a speaker's audience can't return to an earlier argument read more closely or skip to the end to get to the point. That audience needs help from the speaker, who lays ideas out in, the, out in with purposeful repetition and appealing crescendo to ensure maximum comprehension and assent. You can you keep on going. Okay. The speech structures below illustrate these concepts at work. Alan Monroe's motivated sequence, for instance, seizes your attention or establishes something the audience needs to scare them. Claims to have found something to satisfy that need or confuse them. Allows the audience to visualize that need or tempt them, and then tells them what they can do to get what they want or close them. One example of crescendo is the late great Billy Mays, whose sham wow ads will live into eternity. You guys all familiar with Billy Mays, at least in some way, shape, or form? this towel. It's like a chamois, it's like a towel, it's like a sponge. A regular towel doesn't work wet. This works wet or dry. Doesn't drip. Doesn't make a mess. Bring it out. Chamois holds 20 times its weight in liquids. Here's some cola. Wine, coffee, cola, head stain. Not only is the damage going to be on top, it's put on the spill, turn it over. Without even putting any pressure, 50% of the cola right there. You follow me, camera guy? The other 50%, the color starts to come up. So the reason why I'm trying to align Monroe's motivated sequence with this in particular is because he's following almost exactly, like verbatim, the structure that is being set out here. First, he grabs your attention. It's like, Billy May is here, right? Like he has that sort of persona that we had muted at first. Uh, I've got something for you. This is the sham wow. It does so much stuff. Now I've shocked you, right? Like now I've got your attention. Then I'm going to scare you. And literally in this case, most of the time they pour red wine or coffee on white carpet, which at least for obsessive people like myself is very stressful. Right? So it's literally trying to scare you into thinking that, oh gosh, I've got this need that really needs to be satisfied right now. And guess what? He has the solution. He puts the ShamWow right on top of it, need satisfied. Guess what's going to happen at the end? He's going to give you a call to action that's going to tell you exactly how you can get a ShamWow into your hands too. So Billy Mays presents one kind of persuasive structure. It sounds just like nonsense. It sounds just like you know, tele-advertisements or whatever. But 
this actually is very well structured. There is a method behind it. All right, let's go on to the next one. Can I get another uh, volunteer for the next section? Cicero's own strategy of proof also offers an example of a well-arranged speech, but has a somewhat different purpose in mind. Here, the objective is to rebut a counter-argument or to present the best alternative for the present state of affairs. He begins by providing his thesis in a, strategical, in a strategically arranged introduction or prom. He establishes the facts of the case, things everyone knows we can agree on. Then he introduces a fissure between himself and his opponent an unbridgeable gap between the two of them. He then makes his case laying out the claim, the evidence, and the connective logic between the two. He ends first by rebutting his opponent's major counter-arguments, and then restates his thesis, this time with urgency and passion. The key here is repetition. We get Cicero's thesis at least three times throughout his speech, the speech. First in the prone, then in his proof, and finally in his conclusion. In between these steps, Cicero builds momentum for his final maneuver, the emotional appeal. So this is Cicero's recommended method, right? And this is also going to be the speech structure, or a speech structure, that I'm going to recommend to you for the diagnostic speech. Last time, we talked a little bit about how to structure your introduction, and then some vague outlines for what the main points would actually look like. And um, if you weren't here, or if you happen not to remember that conversation, there's an outline template on the back of the diagnostic speech handout. Here, what Cicero is doing is he's filling out those main points a little bit more for you. What I asked you to do for the diagnostic speech is to argue from a controversy or a position that you are passionate about. Here, Cicero is trying to give you an opportunity to do exactly that. First, you establish the facts of the case. Regardless of who you are, these are the things that we can think about environmental activism. These are the facts. These are the things that we know. These are the things that can't be disputed. Then he goes on to establish the division between himself and his opponent. So this is my position, and these are the positions that disagree with me. I want to set myself apart from them. Afterward, he provides the proof, and this is going to lead us into the Toolman model next, which is the claim, the warrant, and the data, or the claim, the warrant, and the grounds for his position, or the position that he wants to advance at that particular point in time. Afterward, he provides a, a, a rebuttal, saying that, OK, I've told you why I'm different from my opponent. Now I'm going to tell you why my opponent is wrong. And finally, he concludes with passion. That's a fairly simple formula for you to also ad, uh, apply in your own speeches. And it doesn't take away from what I said before, which is that your introduction and your conclusion should be mirror images of each other. So if the introduction is structured as an attention-getting device, then a thesis, then a purpose, then a preview, that means that your conclusion should be structured as a review, a purpose, a thesis, and then your attention-getting device again. So you're just repeating the introduction, or you're putting the same pieces together, but in the opposite order. Okay. So the first lesson about arrangement or about structure in general is that the audience has to understand the message, right? Part of the reason why Billy Mays works, part of the reason why Cicero works, is because we've heard speeches like this before. All right. <clears throat> Let me give you one more clip, and then we're going to go on to the, the big argument structures for the day. Uh, Story. It's about this piece of music. It's a very popular piece of music. I'm sure you all know it, but I'll sing the melody right now. Yeah, Pocket Bell's Canon in D. It was a big hit in the classical world, and I know this because I'm a geek. I know what you're thinking. It's like, Rob, you can't be a geek. You play guitar. You're so cool. Okay, you weren't thinking that, but I was. Um, well, I haven't always been this cool because I haven't always played guitar. I scouted out on the cello. Yeah, cello is a wonderful, beautiful instrument. It's a cool to be an adult that plays the cello. Being a kid that played the cello sucked. Because there's no way to be cool when your instrument is larger than you. When you walk to school with the cello, you're like a wounded gazelle on the Serengeti. <laughs> the bullies just smell you coming from a mile away. <laughs> oh, I don't know what that thing is, but I know I'm going to 
break it. <laughs> but I put up with all of the abuse because I love the music that we played. I love everything we played in orchestra, except this. I hate Pachelbel's Canon in D with a passion. I hate it so much because the cello part is the worst cello part ever written in the history of cello parts. It's eight quarter notes that we repeated over and over again. They are as follows. D, A, B, F sharp, G, D, G, A. And that's all we got to play. We repeated those eight notes 54 times. I counted because I had nothing else to do. I would sit back and listen to the violins get lovely melodies, the violas would get lovely melodies, the second violins would get lovely melodies, which should just not happen. <laughs> and the cello, we got stuck with eight crappy, lousy, stinking notes. And I began to wonder why. Why would Pachelbel do that to us? Such a beautiful instrument. And my theory was he once dated a cellist. And she dissed him really bad. And for the rest of his life, he came up with the worst cello parts you could ever think of. It wouldn't be so bad if I didn't hear him every day. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Rob, don't listen to classical radio anymore. I, it doesn't matter. Pachelbel's following me. It sounds paranoid, but he's following you too. You hear him every day. I don't know, I went to my step-nephew-in-law's eighth grade graduation, and their graduation song was a song by Vitamin C. No. As we go on, we'll remember la da 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 So I drive home, I turn on some classic rock, some Aerosmith. There was a time when I was so broken hearted. La da 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 So I got home, I thought I'd clear my mind with some folk music. No. Listen, children, to my story. It was written long ago. Da 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 They do Paca Bell, just like everybody does Paca Bell, just to torment me. I don't even go to Taco Bell anymore because it sounds too close. <laughs> I hate Pachelbel with a passion. I don't even know his first name. It's probably Johan. They're all named Johan. When you think about it, he's the original one-hit wonder. He had one hit 300 years ago. It's my cross to bear my entire life. Where are they now? That's what I want to know. Where are you now, Pachelbel? VH1's I Love the 1790s. Where is it? And if he would just stay away from music that I love, it would be better, but he won't. He is shameless. He will follow me to the ends of the earth. I went to Horde Festival thinking, no, he couldn't possibly follow me to the Horde Festival. But you know who's at the Horde Festival? Blue Travelers. So that means that Pachelbel was also at the Horde Festival. So, suck it in, suck it in, suck it in, where I'm a little bit of a Make it start moving and you're in. Da 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 So I figure I'm going to listen to punk rock for the rest of my life. No dice. Do you have the time to listen to me whine? Cause all songs have the same damn chords <laughs> Punk music is a joke It's really just Baroque Am I just paranoid? I wanna push you around I will, I will I wanna push you down I will, I will I hope it's been good living with you And my machine head is better than the rest My machine head is better than the See the stone set in her eye See the thorn twist in her I'm on out of faith This is how I feel like what I should like he was a boy, she was a girl. It would be any more obvious we're not gonna take it. No, we ain't gonna take it. On your mark and say go now. Got a dream and we just know now. No woman, no cry. Yeah, yeah. When I find myself in times of trouble, Parker Bell's always following me. I'll see you in hell, Parker Bell. Oh, Parker Bell, Parker Bell. I'll see your ass in hell. I'll see you in hell, Parker Bell. So, point being, right, form is important not because um, it's something that you have to premeditate into your, just because it's something that you have to premeditate, but it's also there for your audience, right? There's a reason why all of these songs are played in the same chords, because they're recognizable in some sense. You listen to it, and it's as though you've listened to it before, and that by itself, even though the content is very different, is always going to register with you. So, that's part of the importance of form. When you're sitting down and reading a textbook, you can go back to the beginning. You can go to the end. You can skip. You can highlight the vocabulary terms, whatever. In a speech, you have to do that work for your audience. And that's why you have to have things like preview statements that repeat yourself over and over again. And that's why it's important that your speech moves from one place or one register to another, 
so that you can actually be presenting to people who are excited to hear what it is that you're saying. So that's the first thing, right? Your audience is the number one concern for you. And that, that's in line with what we talked about in relationship to rhetoric last time as well. Zarefsky calls rhetoric the frame of mind that says that we are receptive to or thinking about an audience. That's exactly what we're doing with form. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, the next thing. Can I get another reader for this section? The second reason that arrangement is important? The second reason that arrangement is important is that it guarantees arguers will make the most logically sound arguments. One thing that determines whether arguments are sound is whether they are assembled properly. Better arguments are those that make claims supported by evidence or data. Better speeches use a, powerful, use a powerful connective logic to create either breadth or depth in their argument. Better arguments anticipate possible objection and take a realistic gaze at the issues that prohibit change from occurring. Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, please do. The following speech structures um, are the models for this class, or the standard templates you should use when crafting your own and analyzing others' arguments. Uh, in order to, in order presented below, the these structures move from smallest to largest, from the level of individual sentences, the Toulmin model, is that, mm -hmm. okay. uh, to the level of your speech as a whole, the stock issues. All right. So I want to just talk through this a little bit, and I'll read this out loud, but then I want to explain what I mean by the scale of these different speech structures. The Toulmin model, like I say here, is designed for making well-reasoned individual claims. That means that it is about single arguments that you are making. So it is supposed to be the sort of gram or uh, atom of argument in some sense, in, the, in that you're trying to put together a basic unit that eventually you're going to string together into a larger speech. But for right now, the Toulmin model is just about saying one claim, the specific evidence for that claim, and then the thing that connects that evidence to the claim that you're making. Then the second thing that we're going to talk about, or the, the bigger, the second order of scale, is the logical dependency model. And this is a way of connecting different claims to one another. Um, and uh, for those of you who've you know, taken a, a physics class or had to, to do something with circuit diagrams in the past, we're going to compare the two kinds of dependency to circuit diagrams of series structure and parallel structure. So logical dependency connects individual uh, claims with a logical chain. And there are two kinds. The logically dependent model uses separate, or in, independent model uses separate claims to support a central thesis. The claims have nothing to do with one another. And in a dependent structure, the claims are interlinked with one another. Each claim depends on the next, and that builds up to your thesis. The last thing, and the biggest scale of structure that we're going to talk about, and this is going to be the template that you're going to use for policy speeches, is the stock issues model. And this is a dependent structure, a logically dependent structure, that is designed specifically for accomplishing a policy-oriented goal. So from smallest to largest, it goes Toulmin, logical dependency, and then the stock issues. And as a handy reference, and I won't talk through this right now, um, but this table basically lays everything out that you need to know about it. There's one last thing that I want to, to say about this, too. Um, and I think this is on the handout, but I don't know if it made it on, uh, onto, the, onto my lecture notes. <coughs> on the handout, I think I note that these argument structures are one of the comprehensive elements of this class. That means that when we're reading nudge or switch or getting to yes, and we find an argument in there that we discuss, that argument can be used in a quiz or in an exam setting um, to ask what kind of argument structure is at work here? Is this person using the proper evidence to connect to their claim? What kind of warrant is being used in this, in this uh, particular sentence? Is the structure of this paragraph logically dependent or logically independent? And what stock issue is being addressed here? That could be a question that you are asked on quiz one, quiz two, quiz three, or quiz four. So just know that when it comes to speech structures, this is kind of like the codex that we're going to be using for the rest of the semester. All right. <coughs> so.
so three argument structures. Um, I put up all the vocabulary terms just for my own reference and for yours, so you I have a sense of what terms belong with which model. But the most general argument terms, the ones that apply to all of these models, are induction and deduction. Um, someone read inductive reasoning for me? Or actually just both, inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive, if I need to go from a specific case to a general. Mm -hmm. And deductive is the opposite. Okay, so can you give me an example? Because uh, that, that's absolutely right. Yeah, you're a nice teacher. Everyone at NC State's are nice teachers. Okay. It's an inductive. And uh, well, if I have a fact that every teacher's every teacher's at the NC State is stressed out. Yeah, you'll probably be stressed out. Yeah. So it's a question of whether or not you have complete information. And I mean, like saying exactly what you said. Um, like the book says, when you have incomplete information, you're required to make an induction, right? So if you have only pieces, then you're going to have to build up to a conclusion. That would be an induction. Then deduction, you know something for sure. There are truths out in the world. There's an if and then principle. If I get this result back on this medical test, then it guarantees that I have cancer, or there's a very high probability that I have cancer, right? I get that test result. Therefore, what? Yeah, that, that would be deduction. So induction, arguing from uncertain premises to a conclusion. Deduction, arguing from certainty to a particular instance. All right. So the Toulmin model. Um, the Toulmin model, you actually have, let me see if I can cut between these two. So the Toulmin model has five parts to it. And I want to present the parts in, uh, in a specific order here as well, just so you have a good sense of what, the most important, what I think the most important part and uh, the, the parts that you need to pay slightly less attention to or the things that you need to consider after the major claim is made. The biggest elements of this are going to be the claim and the evidence. And depending on the diagram, it's a little bit confusing even on the diagram that I've provided here, the data is going to be called something different. Toulmin calls it data. Other people call it grounds. I'm going to call it evidence. Because at the end of the day, it is what you are marshalling in order to support your claim. Every claim, every individual argument is structured in this way. A claim, or I should write it in the way that they present it, a, uh, evidence or data is connected to a claim. So for instance, this goes back to the, the lesson, the pre-lesson from last time. I am an optimist. It does not seem to be any use being anything else. What is the claim? What is the evidence? Are you sure? So a claim is uh, Your thesis and I guess you could say that, right? Like I'm an optimist. And then the data or evidence is that it's no use being anything else. The reason why I asked you that question is that in the pre-lesson actually is backwards, right? Mm -hmm. It says that this is the premise and then this is the conclusion. So it is no use being anything else. Um, if I were going to rewrite this. This is, I, I'm sorry I tricked you there, Rosie. Uh, and this is a little light, but I'll read it out loud.
just because, and the reason why I'm doing this is also just because a claim of, or um, it appears in that sequence, I am an optimist, it doesn't seem to be much use being anything else, doesn't mean that the claim is coming first and then the evidence is coming afterward. Sometimes you can make, you can place the evidence first and then make the claim after. So it is no use being anything but an optimist, and then the evidence is, or the, no, I'm wrong about this. I'm absolutely wrong about this. I'm really sorry. You were right. So I, I really apologize, guys, just so I didn't confuse anyone. Ignore what I just said, all right? Just ignore it. I am an optimist. The claim, reasons for it, because it is no use being anything else, OK? Wipe the slate clean. For those of you watching, I am very sorry to. So. <laughs> Got me is how quickly you changed. Like you were mid sentence. Like, I was like, no, no, nope, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Right. Yeah, I, I realized it when I was as I was saying it. So anyway, this is now that I've like corrected myself. Is this part clear enough? Like I am an optimist. The thing that you're arguing, then because or the reason for it is that it, there's no use to be anything else. Um, the next part of it, and this is as important and more confusing but I'm going to get this right, I promise, is the warrant. So it seems as though like every time that you present your claims, every time you present your arguments, all you're going to do up front is present your claim and then your evidence. But then you have to explain why those two things are related to each other. Because if you just assume that the evidence is related, then it's not going to work out. And for this, you have this W, the warrant, the connective logic that binds the claim to the evidence. So why is this claim appropriate, or why is this claim something that we can uh, consider in relationship to this evidence? Is the evidence appropriate to the claim? And how do we know whether the evidence is appropriate to the claim? For that purpose, we have a number of different kinds of warrant, and these are uh, additional terms that I should put up here, too. The argument from example, the argument from uh, causal correlation, Causal correlation. I'll get to it. Because there are two different kinds of cause that are being talked about. The difference between causal correlation and causal generalization in the book mm -hmm. is that one is inductive, the other one is deductive. So the inductive warrants are going to be the argument from example, argument from causal correlation, argument from analogy. The deductive arguments are going to be the argument from sign and the argument from causal generalization. <clears throat> so let me just give you a couple of examples of warrants in general, and then we'll go to the specific warrants themselves. So up here, for instance, the claim. Harry is a British subject. Why? What is the evidence for this? Because Harry was born in Bermuda. And that's, that's it. That's the connection. The reason why is because Bermuda, at the time that Tillman is writing it, is a British territory. And so so um, that's basically the, the, the major claim. That's the, the skeleton of this, this argument. But then he adds this warrant. <coughs> A man born in Bermuda will be a British subject. Because the Bermuda question is open, right? Like, that doesn't make any sense until we are given that additional link between the claim and the evidence. All right, one more. Claim, you need to quit smoking. Why? Because smoking causes cancer. The warrant? People with cancer are more likely to die. So in both cases, the warrant is fulfilling this function. I'm just trying to illustrate the definition right now. The warrant is connecting the claim to the evidence. It's the, the logic that we're using in order to, to make that connection. Um, before I go to the backing or to the qualifier um, or to the rebuttal, I want to 
to take a look at specific warrants and specific tests for those different warrants. Now, you'll notice on that reasoning handout that you have a quick and easy reference um, for a number of these different kinds of warrants as well as examples. These are not the examples I'm going to go through in detail, but they're here for you for your, uh, for your own benefit. I might, I might talk about one or two, I don't know. So, <clears throat> the big points here. Claim warrant data, those are the major components of the Toolman model. Then backing and qualifier, I'll talk about briefly in a second. And the warrant has specific kinds of tests in order to determine whether or not the claim and the evidence can be connected to each other. So this is stuff that you guys have read about at this point. So uh, the arguments from example. Can you guys give me an, ex an example of that? Make a claim and then use an example to justify it. Yeah. My friend Billy wants to smoke a cigarette and he got lung cancer, so you probably shouldn't smoke. Okay. Um, <coughs> why is that an argument from example? I have no idea. I was just okay. to come up with a good example. No, no, that's fine. That's, that's great. Be an example, I guess. No, it is, it is an example, right? It's also an argument from cause, which is, you know. So uh, you have one example, your friend Billy, uh -huh. right? Um, your friend Billy smokes, therefore he has cancer. Sure. I think that an argument from example would, might go like, I think that that's more cause just because Billy smokes and got cancer. Mm -hmm. Therefore, anyone who smokes gotcha. will get cancer. Can't you argue that's anecdotal? It is anecdotal, but examples are anecdotal um, in at least some way. And, the fact that Billy got this this condition, like the, the best cigarette lobby in the world will tell you, you know, the, the fact that Billy got this condition doesn't guarantee that everyone's gonna get this condition, right? So that that's the argument from example. The idea here and the present the examples presented in the book of this this warrant strategy are always presenting more examples than one. So the way to short circuit the, the cigarette lobby's argument against Matthew right now would be to say that, look, Billy's not the only one. In fact, the statistics show that the majority of people who uh, smoke cigarettes actually get cancer. So, um, as far as this is, uh, the, the argument is exa from example is concerned, the different tests that you apply are basically standards for evaluating that evidence and claim relationship. And the, you know, the, the book provides you with four and I'd encourage you to go back to that textbook or to that chapter that you read for today to get more detailed examples of each one of the tests. So the first test is that are there a sufficient number of examples? Are the examples of the class the arguer is trying to generalize to? So for instance, if Billy actually died of leukemia um, that was unrelated to cigarette smoking, then you would have a problem with that argument at that point too. <coughs> are the negative examples sufficiently accounted for? That means for every person who smoked a cigarette and did not get cancer, can we account for why that was the case? And then finally, are the cited examples relevant to the claim being advanced? And that seems, uh, seems similar to number two, but is everyone pretty clear on that? Arguments from analogy. So um, later in the semester, we're going to read through nudge, like I said, and at one point, there is a chapter where the author is arguing about social security. And one of the, the, instead of talking about American social security, they turn to the Swedish social security system and a crisis that they faced at the beginning of uh, the 2000s. At that point, in order to make an argument about how we should revise our social security system, they're relying on a parallel example or a parallel case study. And in that case, that's an analogy, right? The, Social security system in Sweden functions as an analogy for the social security system in the United States and the kinds of policies that we should implement in order to fix it. That would be, in a lot of ways, what is being called here a literal analogy, a statement drawing a direct comparison between two plus cases. Social security in this case is enough like social security in that case in order for us to make this claim. A figurative analogy would be if I instead decided to compare social security as a process to photosynthesis which has absolutely nothing to do with Social Security, but might have some passing resemblance to it. So the more metaphorical it becomes, the more figurative the analogy becomes. Yeah? But if you use a lot of examples, 
examples, what, wouldn't that like hold up the audience like trying to like find the warrant behind tying the example <coughs> more than your actual argument? Like say like I would be like, oh, Sweden's not enough like the U.S. to do this. I'd spend most of my time like trying to figure the connection between the example and like the actual argument you're trying to make. Sure, and I guess like if I were trying to state it in the abbreviated form that was in that Toulmin model sheet before, it would go something like this, right? The United States needs to revise its social security system. Um, so that would be my claim. The evidence is Sweden faced similar problems in the early 2000s and addressed it improperly. And then my warrant would be the Swedish social security system is structured in a way that uh, is sufficiently similar to the structure of the American social security system. Now, proving that claim, trying to like find evidence for my warrant, right? That, that's its own process. And your audience would be right to question that, right? Because there's a big difference between the social security systems. The social security system in Sweden is private. The social security in the United States is not. So um, the tests, these are pretty similar, or pretty uh, easy to, to get to. Are the compared cases alike in some meaningful way? And are the compared characteristics accurately described? Okay, causal correlation. <coughs> I just wanna useful this little diagram is going to be, but I want to just remind you of the difference between induction and deduction when I'm talking about these two kinds of pause. So um, let, me, let me talk about causal correlation, the difference between causal correlation and causal generalization. All right? Let's say that you find out, and this is just stolen from the textbook, you find out that a large number of people who live in low, um, like in, in poor households, and households that low, earn less than the minimum wage income, have video game systems, and that those particular individuals are also predisposed to violence. At that point, you have two phenomena that correlate with one another, right? They're side by side, they seem to be attached roughly, but you have no way of really knowing for sure whether or not Call of Duty is related to the actual gun violence that's taking place in the area. At that point, you're making a causal correlation argument. You look at household one, household two, household three, and building from those different examples, move inductively to the claim, Call of Duty causes violence, right? That would be the causal correlation. You start with a loose association, association between two variables, and then you state or you hypothesize a causal relationship between them. So are we in agreement that that argument would be almost indefensible and oh, yeah. full of fallacy? Yeah, and I'm, I'm setting that up in a way because the tests that are here also pull that argument apart in okay. so many ways. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, so no, that, it's a bogus argument, totally wrong. Um, causal generalization, on the other hand. There are some causal relationships that we know are fairly consistent, right? Go back to photosynthesis. When you apply sunlight to a plant, typically, you know, that, that encourages it to metabolize. Typically, when you share hypodermic needles that, with someone who has been infected with uh, a disease that's transmitted through the blood, you will acquire that disease, right? Those are cause-effect relationships that are more set in stone than the one that I just said about the, the violence and, and Call of Duty. At that point, you can extrapolate from that argument into a concrete number of cases. So the hypodermic needles example, again taken from the textbook, so-and-so shared hypodermic needles with someone that, uh, or no, we know that when you share hypodermic needles with someone infected with HIV, you yourself become significantly more likely to acquire HIV. So-and-so shared needles with someone who has HIV. Therefore, right? And from that 
point of view, we're not moving from the examples up to the claim. We're moving from the claim, this causal relationship that we know exists already, down to the examples. Okay. So causal generalization and causal correlation. You guys get on the, the difference between the two? So causal correlation. This is that gun violence argument that I talked about before. Um, test 1.1. There, there's three tests that are part of the first test. And you can thank John Stuart Mill for that one. So concomitant variation. If an increase in x leads to an increase in y, then a decreased x should also lead to a decrease in y. In other words, if I take all the Call of Duty away from the inner city kids that I'm trying to analyze, then violence should go away, right? But unlikely. Two, or 1.2. If two, and this is terribly phrased, but if two or more instances of the phenomenon have only one circumstance in common, the circumstances in which alone all instances agree is the cause of the phenomenon. Okay. Restated. Is this the only commonality observed in the causal relationship? Are there other factors which might better explain the observed effects? In other words, when we're looking at Call of Duty, why are we looking at the video game system instead of looking at um, the effect of low income on violence? Or perhaps the education system that's in the area around that, that environment, right? So as soon as I start introducing other factors which are plausible causes for violence in the area, then the causal argument that I was making originally from induction starts to fall apart. The last one, the method of difference, and I'm not even going to bother to read what Mill says. What is the difference between the cases in which the effect is observed and other identical cases wherein the observed effect does not occur? Think about it in terms of twin studies, right? You have one twin who stays in the place where they were born, another twin who is shipped off across the country to an entirely different neighborhood. One of them commits an act of gun violence, the other one does not. What's the difference? The environment, right? Like, or that would be your claim, and I, I wouldn't, you know. But yes, absolutely. But that would be the cause at that point, right? By pointing to that difference, you're also pointing back to the cause of the violence. If all things are the same, then the one difference between them is going to be the cause. All right. And then the last two tests for causal correlation are pretty straightforward as well. Is the association between cause and effect a strong one? And we could even reject the argument that I made earlier on that basis. And does the movement from cause to effect follow a regular and predictable time sequence? What is the regular and predictable time sequence? Is that like the number of hours spent on a video game? Yeah. It, I mean, um, so after playing 45 hours of Call of Duty straight and then putting someone into a paintball arena, we observed like an increase from the Call of Duty player who was only sitting there from five minutes on, right? Like that person was significantly more aggressive. You, you, you kind of get it, right? There is a, a chain between them. It's not just that there's a light switch flipped on necessarily, or that some people take significantly longer to acclimate to violence than other people. So the two deductive arguments. So the argument from sign. <clears throat> Arguments from sign are um, follow the, the reasoning. If there's smoke, there's fire, right? If there are cancerous cells in my uh, in my screening, then I have cancer. And that's why it's also deductive because there's always an association. When you see smoke, you know that there's going to be something flammable attached to it, right? So that's why this is also a deductive argument because there's an assumed relationship between the sign and the thing that it stands for. So. Um, where there's smoke, there's fire. I see smoke in the distance, therefore there must be fire out there too. Right? Tests of it. Are the sighted signs always indicators of the general theories getting use? Not necessarily. Like it could, it might not be fire. Right? It could be something else. Um, are there enough signs present to support the conclusion offered? And are contradictory signs present? And if so, have they been considered? All right. Causal generalization. And we, we talked about that a little bit already, right? The deductive version of the causal argument. Is the cause identified sufficient to produce the effect? Might the cause result in other different effects? And might intervening factors preclude the expected relationship? Can we go back over causal generalization? Sure. So 
argument from causal generalization, just the, the cancer screening, or uh, what I'd use, the hypodermic needle example. Okay. Right. <coughs> so in the hypodermic needle example, um, we say that people who share, uh, uh, people living with HIV who share needles are likely to transmit that disease to other folks. Right? That, that's our, our causal generalization. Um, Billy shared needles with someone with HIV, therefore he's likely to have HIV. Um, is the cause identified sufficient to produce the effect? Is it sufficient for him to contract HIV through the sharing of a needle? Yes. Okay. Passes that test. Might the cause result in other different effects? Plausibly. Depends on what was in that needle. Right? So, uh, is it possible that something that was injected created a false positive, right? Like if I were just trying to generate a counter argument to this, is it possible that whatever drug that was being taken creates a false positive uh, for HIV, right? Could that have conflicted with the causal generalization that we're making? And then might intervening factors preclude the expected relationship? For instance, was there a, an autoclave in the apartment where those needles were being used? Was there something to clean them to the point where they wouldn't transmit disease anymore? If so, then sharing needles doesn't really matter as much anymore. Not to say that sharing needles is a good thing or anything like that, but you get the idea. All right, I promise you this is the most boring part of the, the lecture, but you've gotten through all of the warrants, and the warrants are the most important part of the Toulmin model. The reason for this is because warrants are gonna be present at every level of your speech. You're going to use them in your individual claims. You're going to use them in every one of the subparagraphs of your speeches. Um, you're going to, to have them. You're going to respond to them in your speeches when other people use them incorrectly. So warrants are very important. That's why I'm dedicating so much time to them. <clears throat> All right. Logical dependency. Could I get a reader for logically dependent up to main point four? Go ahead, Kevin. Outline assuming the chain, um, a logical logically dependent outline assuming the chain of the logistic structure, a way to think about this kind of speech as a set of light, is a set of lights set in series. If you unplug one light, the entire chain will be turned off. As the chain, as the chain structure, the strength of depend, the strength of each depends on all the others. If one link is broken, the chain is destroyed. Thesis, if we regulate campus speech, then intellectual debate will be stifled. If we regulate speech, then God will be vague. If God are vague, then people will be unsure if they apply them. If people are sure, they will hesitate to speak out. If people do not speak out, intellectual debate, intellectual debate will be stifled. Yes. All right. So. So for those of you who forget what a series circuit looks like, series circuits uh, are a good metaphor for this because disqualifying any one of the claims that you just read would disqualify the argument as a whole. So for instance, if I can prove that vague guidelines don't necessarily lead to, pe to people being unsure about them, then the entire thing falls apart. All I have to do is take out one of the arguments, right? And we're starting at the introduction, we go to main point one, we go to main point two, main point three, and then and that speech was also main point four. And then we return to the conclusion. But effectively, we can't return to the conclusion. We can't restate the thesis with certainty if one of the arguments that we made is false. So this is both the strength and the weakness of this particular speech structure. A logically dependent structure makes us A to B, B to C, C to D, in order to make the thesis that A equals D. But if B equals C is wrong, then the whole thing falls apart. That's logically dependent. Additionally, when you look back at, the, uh, at that speech, to bring this back to the Toulmin model, main point one, main point two, main point three, main point four, all of those are individual claims, right? In theory, you would have evidence and a warrant for each and every one of them. So here we're moving from the structure of the individual claim and the evidence that you provide for it to stringing these claims together to make a bigger speech. 
And this is more in line, I think, with the way that you would want to argue for, um, especially the issue debate. All right. Can I get a reader for logically, or actually, no. Let's do logically independent. Can I get a reader for that one? A logically independent outline has the structure of a parallel circuit. Each point can stand alone. Even if one of the points is disproved, disproved, each of the others still substantiates the central claim, the thesis. You should think of each of the main points as a justification or a reason why the thesis is true. This structure presents a set of ideas that stand alone, and the truth of each in no way rests on the others. Thesis. If we regulate campus speech, intellectual debate will be undermined. Main point one, because campus speech codes are unacceptably vague. Main point two, because campus speech codes discourage airing controversial issues. Main point three, because campus speech codes bring bad publicity to the college. So in this one, it's fairly simple because there's a warrant by example that essentially links them all together, right? Here, I'm drawing on three separate instances that do not overlap in order to make my claim. And the advantage here is that if one of those is knocked out, the other two still stand. My thesis can still, still hold up. The disadvantage or the, the difference between these two structures when you actually hear them out loud is that the logically independent structure with these separate reasons creates a sense of breadth. We have three separate reasons, three separate dimensions, an exhaustive list of reasons why we should not create new regulations on campus speech. The logically dependent speech, instead of breadth, creates depth, because you're moving from one argument to another that hooks into it to another that hooks into it, and eventually, at the very end, we get to that, that last point. So the big difference in the way that you deliver these and the way that the kind of impression that you create is breadth and depth. The second one here, creates the impression of breadth, the first one the impression of depth. And just for a little bit more frivolous example, um, right, and going back to this, this uh, diagram that we have here, the logically dependent structure takes this A equals B, B equals C, right? And then the, the independent. So uh, taking koalas are the most evil species on the planet as my thesis, a logically independent speech would structure the main points around separate reasons for this claim. One, because they were feared by the ancient Greeks. Two, because they cause cancer. And three, because they have access to nuclear weapons. A logically dependent speech, koalas are the most evil species on the planet. Koalas assemble on the moon once a year to decide whether to wage war on Earth. During this meeting, thousands of young koalas are eaten. Massacres like this, according to the Geneva Conventions, are evil. Therefore, koalas are evil. Everyone good on logically dependent, logically independent speech structure? Which one was breadth and which one was depth? Depth is the moon landing one because you're connecting those claims together. In it, and at the very end, it's only at the end that we get that koalas are evil. With the logically independent, koalas are evil, koalas are evil, koalas are evil. Each main point proves that. But in the other, in the, that logically dependent structure, you need all three of those claims in order to get that general point. Okay, so that one more consistent more depth. Yeah. Um, you can use either one. Typically, logically independent is going to be easier to use than logically dependent. And on the outline that I provided you with on the diagnostic speech handout, that one is logically independent as well. Yeah. Is logically dependent harder to actually like, acquire your evidence? No, no, I don't think so at all. Yeah. I think that it is more challenging to figure out exactly uh, what claims you want to make and how to link them together, right? Every speech, and I'm, I'm being a little bit deceptive here, it's actually pretty good that the, uh, the Toulmin model puts data first and then the claim. Every speech, everything that you do in this class is gonna start with the research process. You're gonna cast a net that is way larger than when you actually end up taking it. And then afterward, you'll determine whether or not you're going to do it logically independently or logically dependently, and so on. So the logical dependent structure, I think, gives you 
a kind of sophistication in the argument that you're making because it shows the sort of step-by-step -step process by which you reach the conclusion that you got to. So you get this impression that you're going through the reasoning of the speaker as they're going through it too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Um, I have. I, I can. I can answer this question. Like, how? How do you? Like, in, in essence, the question is, how do you defend against like the two weaknesses of these speeches, right? Um, are you guys curious? You want me to, to talk to you about that? Yeah. All right. Uh, can I erase some of what's here, like the woman at least? So I'm I'm a visual learner. I'm gonna just go back to those diagrams again. So when you're asking about like how do you defend against the weaknesses of each one? Um, I want to suggest two different ways that you can do this, right? No matter what, you're going to have a circuit. But um, how you organize the evidence within each one of the main points is kind of up to you. So one way to guard against this, like if I'm actually an engineer and I'm thinking about, well, oh, damn it, I, you know, I want all these lights to be on, but what if one of them goes out? Like my practical solution to this problem is to introduce a parallel circuit at each step. Well, this is both independent and dependent, right? So the examples are, or no, the, the examples themselves are independent, right? But the speech structure itself is dependent. So going back to that koala is a evil thing, right? Uh, koala is a symbol on the moon. What's here to decide whether to wage war on Earth? Now, I provide two independent pieces of evidence in order to justify that. And at that point, it becomes much more difficult for that main point to be debunked. So by thickening this main point with a logically independent structure, the logically dependent structure as a whole gets a lot stronger. You can also do that the other way, which is basically have a central thesis and then argue dependently within each one of the main points. But that, that's how you get around it. That's how you build redundancy into the system so that you don't leave yourself open to vulnerabilities in the speech. It also relies on someone recognizing that this is what you're doing, right? So that's probably the biggest obstacle to someone actually this is someone who's I guess the, the problem is that like no matter how many like let's say you had the same number of supporting cases for each one, mm -hmm. with the series model, you you would just have to destroy or you know, invalidate one of those parallel things. So you you would Double the difficulty that in that case, but still, it that would come nowhere close to the difficulty in like destroying all of the claims for the other way. If that makes sense. It does. The thing that becomes challenging the logically independent structure, mm -hmm. and the thing that I haven't sold hard enough on that, is the fact that independent structures tend to overlap a lot, mm -hmm. and at that point, the speech loses coherence too. Right? Mm -hmm. So. There, there are risks associated with the other, with, with this other speech structure. So, if I say koalas are evil because they eat their young, and because they wage war, if I'm responding to them, like, are these, are these all that different? Like, can I, can I collapse these? Like, why didn't I just say that these cause violence? Right? It seems like I'm stretching my argument then, and the sense of breadth that I'm establishing here is really not that good. Four minutes left. Um, I didn't get to the stock issues. That's okay. We'll talk about stock issues in um, probably three class periods. You don't need the stock issues in order to do the diagnostic speech, so that, that's absolutely fine. So probably uh, if it's th uh, 121, January 21st, that you're going to have your diagnostic speech, then um, what is it? The following Tuesday, we'll start talking about the uh, issue debate structure. Too. Like I'll give you some, some preview of that. 
All right. Um, I have one last thing I want to talk to you about. And then we'll, we'll be done. First things first, this is a good reference point for your uh, for the Tolman model in general because it provides a specific set of responses to each point along the way. So for instance, the claim, there are two responses that, that my buddy Dan provides, which is first that the claim is too extreme or the claim is unclear. So this is thinking in terms of your response, like it's not just the weaknesses of the logically dependent and independent model. There are also strategic responses that you can make to the Toulmin model as well as to the stock issues model. Here, responding to the claim, the claim is too extreme, the claim is unclear, warrant. Those are all of the tests that we covered, the bulk of what we talked about today. If your warrant fails one of those tests, then we have to reject the claim. Um, and then the data, you either have a bad method for collecting data, you have too much data to be able to draw the conclusion that you want, or too little data to draw the conclusion that you want. So no matter what, you can always catch someone in a bind, right? Can you give an example of which you have too much data? Uh, do you know what the Large Hadron Collider is? I'm sorry. The Large Hadron Collider? I'm familiar with that. I don't know what it does. OK, so it's a large particle accelerator in, uh, near Geneva in CERN. Um, and there, they have a very specific problem like this, which is, they have the ability to collect and so much information that they are collecting that they don't know how to interpret it properly. So drawing the conclusions about the Higgs boson or you know, the fundamental particle of, of you know, physical theory depends on drawing a conclusion from so much information that they don't even have the methods of available yet to, to parse. So at the very beginning, they are already cutting off some 90, you know, upwards of 90% of what it is that they're finding. As an arguer, I could claim that, look, we should disagree with the, the discovery of the Higgs boson on the basis that not all of the data has yet been considered. There's too much data out there for you to actually draw that conclusion. All right. Last thing, very, very last thing. I've also, this last page here, and it's on the, uh, the handout that has basic argument and stock issues as the title. It's the last page, and this is the one that you want to keep with you for the rest of the semester. All of the standard issue responses to claim, not the warrants, those are in the handout that I provided today, and the data are provided on one side here. So you have the standard Toolman model, the very important parts of it, as well as the standard responses to it. And then on the back side, this is what we didn't get to, the stock issues. So not only do you have definitions of each one of the stock issues, but again, standard issue responses to each one of them as well. So when you're looking at your speeches, let me just give you the recap. The diagnostic speech can be structured either logically dependently or logically independently, but um, thank you for the question, Susan, earlier. The, speech that you have on the template is structured as a logically independent speech. Here, you're going to need to know the Toolman model, logical dependency, and the stock issues throughout the semester. But not only do you need to know the definitions, but you should also start keeping in mind the sorts of responses that people can make to them and that you should be making to other people. So when we get to the debate workshops, this is the thing that we'll bring into class. This is the thing that we'll work through more concretely with your specific cases. Uh, for next time, you have an on-balance reading, um, which is a longer reading. But this is much less structure. It's much less specific techniques. And it's much more an open discussion about what counts as good argument, what counts as bad argument, and what's in between. Right. So next time, my plan is to have a much more roundtable style discussion about that, because I don't have to just drop this stuff in the outline for me. Um, if you have any questions, if I missed you on attendance or anything, then uh, let me know. Uh, and I will see you next Tuesday.
question? Yeah. Status quo. Status quo is just um, the current state of affairs. Like if you substitute status quo with the way things are. And the reason why it's important is because when you argue in the policy debate for a policy, at that point you need to uh, depart from the status quo. Every plan must depart from the status quo. So no matter how good things are right now, it's not good enough. That's the idea. Oh no no, and I would have gotten to this, but yeah, okay. only an hour fifteen minutes. So yeah. My friends and I are close to like discussing that argument that we had. Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, please do. I want to know. Like, I'm curious about like um, when is that supposed to happen? It's supposed to happen over the weekend. Okay. All right. Well, good luck. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just wanted to get some clarification about the diagnostic. I know you just talked about it and stuff. No. But it's just um, it's supposed to be like the introduction of like I'm in and I'm passionate about this and this is why. Or is it like making a case for or against something? You can do either one of those two things, right? Okay. I would prefer the second, honestly. Because it's against a case for or against. Okay. Right? Rather than this is, you know, like um, I'd like it to be something that you can take a side on, and if you'd like to use this instead, like the one thing I didn't say to the class, if you want to use the Cicero, this is why it was up there too, then you can also use that, and that's much more of a position-taking speech in a lot of ways, right? Um, but you can, like I said, you can use either, either. I would prefer that you don't go up there and say, look, my name is Ian, um, this is a controversy that I'm very passionate about, and I'm just going to tell you about this controversy. I'd rather you say, look, my name is Ian, I'm passionate about environmental controversies, and I strongly believe that um, everyone who attends NC State should be required to use a bicycle on campus or something, right? Like, that, you, you right, so issue a claim. So don't state the facts, like, be, be on the position to, like, state your case? Well, I mean, I don't, I, here, there wouldn't be any difference, right? right. So you would state your th I believe everyone at NC State should be riding on a bicycle. Um, most people are going to say, or you know, my opponents, who, all of you who drive cars are going to say, no, no, and you know, obviously, like I can understand that you would have a dis difference of opinion, but all the same, we can agree that cars are noisy, cars are polluting, uh, the people are at risk for getting injured, and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. right? But you would be presenting your case against that hypothetical case at that point. Okay. And you would still be stating the facts, right? Like, because cars are noisy, cars pollute, and so on. Everyone, everyone knows that. Everyone agrees on that. Then you would be making your specific departure from those facts, saying that, well, based on these facts, I think that we need to act in this way. Um, cool. So if I do, like, a, you said, I think the last time, that if I get, like, a rough outline on it, you could look at it? Sure. Um, I need it by about Thursday. In that case, or not Thursday. I need it by... Well, if you send me an outline over the weekend, mm -hmm. then I can I can review it, right? Okay. Like so, email at this point is the best way to do it because if you gave it to me on Tuesday, I wouldn't right. get it back to you until the speech day. So, right. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, sorry, I missed a class. On no, that's Tuesday. fine. That's it. And I was wondering if there was any like important discussions, like in this. Uh yeah yeah there were <laughs> there were a lot. Um, let's see. Let, Give me a second. Yeah. Basically, you talked about all the handouts that's on the, the middle, right? Yeah, I did. Uh, I talked about handouts one and two. Um, there was also the reading. Thank you for arguing. Um, and let's see. I also talked about the diagnostic speech. Oh, yeah, I need to know about that. Yeah. So, uh, oh, hang on. Please stop.